Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Samantha Johnson, and I am the Assistant Director of Alumni Engagement at the University of Colorado Boulder's Leeds School of Business. Leeds is a top business school offering undergraduate, MBA, MS, and PhD programs, and has an alumni network of over 41,000 strong living and working around the world. We're excited to have Mike Hugelay presenting on emotional intelligence the importance of both IQ and EQ in the workplace and in life for today's webinar. A few housekeeping items before we begin. First, if you have any questions now or during the presentation that you would like to ask Mike, please send those questions through the chat interface. I will monitor questions as they are submitted and Mike will respond to them at the end of the presentation. As a reminder for optimum audio quality, we do have everyone in listen-only mode, except for myself and our speaker. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please notify us through the chat interface and one of our support specialists will touch base. Lastly, a link to access the webinar recording will be sent to all registrants later today along with a survey link. Now, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Mike Hugelay has over 15 years of experience in the healthcare industry, focused on growth efforts including physician and hospital partnerships, joint ventures, and mergers and acquisitions. He completed his undergrad at St. Louis University and subsequently earned his MBA from the Leeds School of Business in 2006. Mike is currently the Chief Development Officer for Private Equity-backed U.S. Renal Care, the third largest kidney care company in the U.S., where he leads growth efforts for the company. Prior to joining U.S. Renal Care, Mike was the Chief Development Officer per, for private equity-backed North Star Anesthesia. He has also served roles as a Vice President with DeVita Healthcare Partners, a Fortune 500 healthcare company based in Denver, and as a Vice President with St. Charles Capital, a Denver-based investment bank. Mike began his career with Arthur Anderson, providing operational consulting across several industries, including healthcare. Welcome, Mike, and thank you so much for being here. Hi, Sam. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be here, and, and welcome, everybody. Uh, I hope I know some of you out there from uh, my time on campus back in 04, 05, and 06 um, as a Leeds alum, as, as an MBA student, or in some of my engagement post-school, and, and I'm sure many of you uh, or some of you may have even helped me in my connections throughout the Denver and, and Colorado community. Um, today I come to you from Dallas, Texas, uh, my office here with U.S. Renal Care, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but uh, I wish I were, and I'll soon be back in sunny Colorado on Thursday to, I guess that's tomorrow, uh, where I know it's sunny and, and looking forward to Thanksgiving with my family, etc. So today uh, I'd like to jump into a topic that I find uh, very interesting and I've continued to be interested over the past few years and that is, as Sam mentioned, emotional intelligence and what I, what I view is uh, the importance of balance between both IQ and EQ uh, no matter what you do. So I will uh, walk you through my thinking on this. Before I do, uh, I, a couple disclosures, a couple important disclosures. Number one, in terms of my skill set, uh, I am not a PhD. I admire PhDs very much, and I also am not qualified in the Department of Human Resources, which I think uh, many folks in the HR world can attest that this is probably a very important topic and what they see in managing their teams and their people. Um, and I'm also not a psychologist, although, again, I have uh, a great interest in these types of topics. I'm going to talk about a couple of different, uh, uh, you know, a couple different products out there that uh, I'll talk about throughout this, this conversation. And I, I will disclose that I am not an investor, nor am I in any way affiliated, but I find there to be some pretty good tools out there uh, if you're interested in learning more about, about EQ. The way I think about this is I have an interest in EQ as a business person, which I assume many of you are, uh, both in how I work with others and how I seek to identify talent. But nonetheless, as Michelangelo said, I am a student of EQ, I'm still learning this topic very much, and I, again, have a great deal of interest in, in the topic. So a little bit about me, and this will help ground you as I go through the next 20 slides or so. Um, you know, this is my family. Uh, this is a picture, actually, we're downtown in Larimer Square. 
uh, right before going to see the Frozen. Uh, any of you, excuse me, not, uh, yeah, Frozen, the, the, uh, the episode that came through town at the Performing Arts Center. Uh, but my family is important to me for a lot of reasons, not the least of which I learned from them a lot. I'm far, far from perfect as it relates to EQ, but you know, the good thing is my kids don't know that yet, only my wife does. Uh, we love the mountains, we love to mountain bike, we travel quite a bit, and so uh, nonetheless love the state of Colorado. Um, as many of you probably did, we carved pumpkins recently, and so that was fun. We're now gearing up for our Thanksgiving holiday and a Christmas holiday as well. As Sam mentioned, uh, I was an MBA alum. I am an MBA alum, graduated in 2006. Uh, loved my time on campus at CU Boulder. Uh, I still am close with a number of my classmates, but just really had an amazing experience at Leeds, and I'm so appreciative of what Leeds has done for me in terms of networking me into the Colorado community. I also, as Sam mentioned, graduated from SLU, and my, my focus has always been in finance and MIS, so lest you think that emotional intelligence can't be uh, you know, transcend to folks in the finance world. Um, I'm here to tell you that it does. I very much believe it does. Hopefully, I'll prove that today. And then a little bit more about my background, because again, I think it's important in the context. You, know, you may have thought that you were getting um, someone that has a psychology background and understands EQ, but as I said, I'm a student, um, but I, I have worked at a number of or organizations that I think have taught me a bit about EQ and the importance of it. Arthur Anderson, for those of you that remember that when it was in its heyday before bad things happened, the few bad apples, um, Arthur Anderson was a wonderful organization around mentoring, coaching, et cetera, um, and I, I believe very strongly in, in what they uh, what they stood for on that topic. I uh, post post graduate school, so post MBA, I went to uh, Denver Bank, Denver Investment Bank, uh, learned cut my teeth in the world of finance more aggressively, and then uh, joined Devita, which is uh, a downtown Denver-based company. I admire Devita uh, greatly, and the career opportunity Devita afforded me for about five years, but again, I think DaVita is a great example of what EQ is all about and how to really lead and manage focused on, on EQ. They would use a different term than EQ, but in, in the end of the day, it's, it's the same thing. Spent a couple years with a former DaVita individual at an at a, at anesthesia company based in Dallas, but continued to live in Denver, and I just joined Re U.S. Renal Care. We're about a $1.2 billion dialysis company, much like DaVita. Uh, we participate or we, we uh, compete in different markets, but uh, we are focused on growth in this market, and it's something that, again, I do every day. I have a team that focuses on growth, and we continue to focus on growth and deals in the dialysis space. Let me take a, a moment. Um, I'm interested in those of you on the phone uh, understanding your functional area. Uh, I just put a few up here. So we're going to do a poll. Sam's going to open it up very, very briefly, and I'd just like to get a feel for participants on the line, uh, where would you put yourself in terms of your functional area? Accounting and finance, number one. Uh, number two, consulting. Number three, operations and administration. Number four, sales and marketing, or five, on other bucket. So Sam, can you Great. lead us in a poll? Absolutely. So we're launching this now. So as Mike said, what is your functional area? We have five options here today. And we'll leave it open here for a few seconds. It looks like we've got about 75% of folks who have responded. Awesome. We'll give it about 10 more seconds here. All right. And thank you, everyone, for your responses. So, uh, Mike, the responses are in, and 13% of our attendees, their functional area is accounting and finance, 10% are consulting, 25% operations and administration, 25% sales and marketing, and then 25% are other. Great. Go ahead and Thanks hand so it back much, over Sam. to you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, th this is helpful for me. In my experience, as it relates to EQ and emotional intelligence, most are more likely to disagree with the need for EQ if you're in, with all due respect, those in accounting finance and perhaps those in operations and administration, depending on what type of environment. Whereas consulting and those consultants on the phone and sales and marketing folks, I bet I have your attention. At least you maybe agree with me a little bit more on the topic of needing a balance between EQ. So, and those that are other, I, I will try to uh, explain my thinking on this at all uh, as we go through it. But again, lest you think this is focused on 
um, the soft side feel good of of uh, of presentation and, and engagement in the business world, I'm going to suggest that EQ is actually much different. So here's my proposal today. My proposal today is that emotional intelligence matters as much as IQ and oftentimes even more, both in business situations and in life. I'm going to go into this, and this is really the topic we'll cover today. So IQ plus EQ, or the balance between IQ and EQ, equals generally equals success, if I could qualify that uh, to some extent. So I, I there, I'm not suggesting that one cannot be successful, and I'm, I'll give you some examples of those that are very successful, despite perhaps what one would consider an imbalance of IQ and EQ, perhaps high, high IQ, low EQ. Uh, well, so we'll talk through some of those. I'm near, merely suggesting that anyone's probability goes up in terms of being successful if you're mindful of this simple combination. So I hope you become more observant of EQ, particularly as we head into the holidays, you'll get spend a lot of time with family, friends, and others, and it gives you a perfect opportunity to observe EQ, your EQ, others' EQ, and identify maybe what you can do to uh, manage it a bit more. So a couple a couple quick stats as it relates to EQ. Um, for those of you that have heard of Talent Smart, um, jot it down. It's a, a, a company that actually, it's a, they have a website. You can just Google Talent Smart. And they have some pretty interesting products. This is where I probably started learning a little bit more about EQ and what it means. Uh, when I was actually at DeVita early on, they did a, uh, they did a, a, a seminar on Talent Smart and EQ. And so this is where I kind of began to understand what it meant. So a couple stats here that uh, I think you can, you can, for sh you can absolutely, uh, uh, you know, question to some extent, but nonetheless, I think directs you toward first one, 90% of top performers have high EQ. 90% of top performers have high EQ. Now, I, I actually buy this in my experience um, or, or close to it. It's very difficult to measure EQ as we'll talk about in a moment, but nonetheless, it feels to me like a lot of folks that are successful have a good balance of how they relate with others and their IQ. I also believe the next one, EQ is responsible for roughly 50% of your job performance. And again, we'll explain this. I'll explain this more as we walk through. And the third one, who knows? I don't know how they got this number, but it's interesting nonetheless. People with high EQ make $29,000 more annually than their low EQ counterparts. Again, I'm not subscribing to that necessarily, but I think it at least makes an interesting point from some folks who spend quite a bit more time focused on EQ than most of the rest of us. So let's talk about how you define or how one defines IQ and EQ. And I pulled this straight from our favorite source these days, Wikipedia, if you trust that. Uh, IQ, I think we all know what IQ is, but it's a number representing a person's reasoning ability measured using problem-solving tests as compared to the statistical norm or average for their age, taking taken as 100. So when you think of someone with high IQ, you think cerebral, brilliant, successful. Um, many, many examples where we think of high IQ equals success. Einstein, our CU professors, our CEOs, leaders in the world, et cetera, et cetera. Again, something we're all very familiar with, the notion of IQ. The definition of EQ, a little bit tougher to, uh, I guess, substantiate or, or quantify in any way, but EQ, or as some would call it EI, emotional intelligence, the capacity to be aware of, to be aware of, to control and to express one's emotions, and to handle, handle interpersonal relationships judiciously and empathetically. In my mind, the words judiciously and empathetically are most critical to that because it's, it's not suggesting that one needs to be emotional, but it's how you handle those relationships. And, you know, the EQ, as I mentioned, is very difficult to measure. Um, and, you know, IQ has been around, I think, since the early 1900s. We've been officially measuring IQ, and it even goes back to the 1800s, whereas EQ, on the other hand, you know, we, we began talking about it in the late 1900s, and there's certainly no systematic way of measuring EQ. Uh, in many ways, it's very, very subjective. So what do you think about when you hear the term EQ or emotional intelligence? What comes to mind? A couple things that I think of immediately are social awareness, someone that is kind or empathetic as defined before, someone who's calm, someone who's personable. I'm sure you have others that, that may come to mind. There's also what I would say is a couple of words that perhaps have a mediocre connotation, the word emotional or the word sensitive. 
um, can sometimes have a, a, perhaps a demeaning connotation in terms of how someone acts. But it, as, as I said earlier, I think really emotional and sensitivity that one has is all focused on how well they manage it or how they manage it in the workplace and what they do. And then there's certainly some negative connotations that I'm sure some of you out there may have thought of weak, manipulative, and the concept of being weak, I would uh, really challenge because I think someone with high EQ uh, really has the ability to know other folks. But there is some literature out there that suggests that folks with high EQ and maybe an imbalance where too much EQ uh, can actually turn folks to be a bit manipulative. And if you really think about it, um, the idea of emotional intelligence is, is observing and managing behaviors and, and, and uh, emotions, and maybe some might take advantage of that. So it's definitely something to be uh, focused and observant of. When I think of images of EQ, uh, there's a bunch out there. Again, if you Google, you get different Im images in terms of self-regulation, motivation, social skills. It's another good one. Maybe you might even think of uh, EQ as being a little lovey-dovey. Uh, again, I, I think differently on that topic, but many of you and many folks do think of this. I also think, uh, as we'll talk about in a moment, that the topic of EQ is very interesting in much of the study going on uh, about the human brain, which um, for those of you that know medicine know that the human brain is actually one of the, uh, we're furthest from, from a scientific standpoint, understanding the human brain and its sophistication. Uh, and if you're in healthcare, one of the things you no doubt know or are learning is that the um, behavioral health space is becoming a very interesting space, and it has been actually for quite some time. There was some legislation passed back in 2006 that focused on uh, behavioral health and actually insurers reimbursing or paying for um, uh, mental health uh, challenges or behavioral health. Uh, there's various types of behavioral health, whether it's depression related, whether it's um, eating disorder related, et cetera, and it's a very, very serious epidemic in, in our world today and costing the healthcare system a lot of money, not to mention the people and the impact that it has in their lives. But my key point here is that there is a science also behind EQ, and it's fascinating in my mind, and, and uh, I think so much more uh, being done on this. You see here uh, my web version of the brain, and I won't try to educate you here because I have no science uh, aptitude, but it all focuses, as you read about EQ, on the limbic system. Which includes, the, which includes the amygdala, which is the part of the limbic system that the arrow is pointing to. It also includes the hippocampus, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the basal ganglia. The, amyg the amygdala is an emotional center of the brain, while the hypothalamus or hippocampus, excuse me, plays an essential role in the formation of new memories about past experiences. So, you may have noticed that I had to read some of that because my scientific, my lack of scientific knowledge, um, but my curiousness has led me to what does this really mean? Is, is there really something more behind EQ? And sure enough, there absolutely is. Again, quite a bit of science behind this. If you do some research, uh, there's a neuroscientist. His name is Dr. Antonio Damasio. Uh, he is uh, originally started overseas, but I believe he's now with USC and he was at the uh, head of neurology for the University of Iowa hospitals. But I, one of the books that I've read, and I would certainly recommend if you have interest in learning more about emotional intelligence, this is a bit of a lengthy book, and there's some science into it, but uh, this book by Daniel Goleman was uh, titled Emotional Intelligence. And one of the things he talked about was Dr. Damasio's studies. And Dr. Damasio studied and focused on the limbic system. And one of the studies that this book talks about um, discusses his studies as uh, studies of patients with damage to the prefrontal amygdala circuit, um, which then impacted decision making, which caused, which he noticed to be, or, or documented to be terribly flawed, uh, but with no deterioration at all in IQ or cognitive ability. So folks were still uh, clearly smart and had all the IQ, the, the aptitude, et cetera, but their decision making uh, and his observation became very flawed. And they also had reduced triggers to emotional reactions. So, so different things would happen and they would, uh, their, their emotional or their reactions to those situations were quite reduced from what would, would have been expected from an emotional perspective. And so he concludes that this led to disastrous choices in business and their personal lives. And again, as I said, you know, this isn't, whereas I believe this is, is scientific, it's not the most cutting edge scientific evidence you've ever seen in your life. Why? Because as I stated earlier, EQ is still such an 
early uh, part of scientific uh, review and and really the uh, the brain itself is such uh, we're in early stages of really understanding the details of how the brain affects what we do every day. Let's talk about some of the recent Leeds webinars and I bring this up because I I've uh, I was sat on a few of these recently. Uh, the most recent one I think it was last week. Tom Gimble on leadership. I thought he did a great job. Uh, I think he had someone. Um, uh, asking him questions, and it was very interesting to hear his perspective. Obviously, a bright, uh, successful CEO um, and someone who expects people to get stuff done, expects a lot of folks. I think during part of his conversation, um, you know, he, he even talked about, you know, uh, work hours and talked about he looks for folks, he looks for talent uh, of folks that have good balance, that don't necessarily need to clock in, clock out from 9 to 5, 9 to 4, but, but really want to have a good balance in their lives. Um, you know, the, the second one on the list, emotional fluency, um, I actually sat on this, uh, this is probably, what, a couple months ago, I think now, uh, Ms. Carol Ross, I found this to be very fascinating. Emotional fluency, I would describe, and she's well, much more versed on this than I am, of course, but uh, Carol walked through the tiers of emotion being expansive, transitional, imprisoning, and constricting, and whereas I think uh, if, if I had the chance to work with her, talk with Carol, I'd be interested in learning more about her thinking on this and where EQ sets into this because I do think there's a difference in emotional fluency and then emotional intelligence. Uh, but nonetheless, very interesting. Even job searching, uh, the one, the webinar that was done uh, about a month ago, in my mind, job searching, getting things done, all these topics ultimately lead to or have engagement with people's focus on emotional intelligence. In other words, you have to have some level of emotional intelligence to have uh, to be successful, I believe, in many of these areas. Talk about examples of VQ, um, and this is uh, one of my favorites, uh, Mr. Homer Simpson. I guess you could, you could probably, uh, we could all have a debate on how successful he's been. Perhaps at home he's perceived to be a, little, a bit less successful, but in the ratings on TV over time he's been very, very successful. But I think you get the point. Homer Simpson is, uh, you know, you probably also argue that he doesn't have the highest IQ, I suppose. Um, but Homer Simpson uh, does not come across as an individual with, with successful or great EQ, whereas Yoda, uh, I would say, has a tremendous balance between IQ and EQ. Uh, he's known for his wisdom, of course, and his emotional relationship with Luke Skywalker and many others in Star Wars. For those of you that uh, enjoy Yoda, he's one of my favorites and I believe is a great example of someone with high IQ, high EQ, excuse me. Let's talk about society a bit more in our society. EQ has serious implications in, in our society. We read about it heck every day now with social media and I'm sure many of you are thinking of examples. I'm going to try to think of a few examples that um, that have surfaced in at least my world, my life recently. And uh, one that comes to mind that I love and reflect on is, uh, gentlemen, this is Congressman John Lewis. This is his book, Walking with the Wind, a book that he wrote, gosh, uh, many years ago at this point. But it's all focused on the civil rights movement and his involvement in the civil rights movement along with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And the reason why I bring this up as it relates to EQ, in my view, what I, as I've read his book and what he went through in Nashville and Selma, et cetera, um, for someone to pursue civil rights movement with the intensity that, doc, that uh, Congressman John Lewis did for many, many years, I, I believe you have to have um, such vision, such emotional intelligence to understand those that are going to believe in you, follow you, how do you engage those people in ways that help all of all of these people reach their dreams um, during a very, very difficult time in our uh, U.S. past. And then I'll counter that example with perhaps um, the infamous Mike Ditka. And for those of you that are Bears fans, I'm sorry, I'll pick on Mike for just a moment. Um, I actually, uh, I like Mike, and, and actually to be a, a football coach and to be as successful as he was, I would actually argue you have to have quite a bit of EQ, quite a bit of emotional intelligence. Why? Because you have to be able to relate to your players regardless of, of uh, their background, socioeconomically, et cetera. You've got to be able to connect with folks in a way and help lead them. But I will say that he made a, a, a remark in recent news that I, I think would at least appear to say, 
boy, did he have a lapse in emotional intelligence or uh, did, did he misstate something? And he got quite beat up for it, but I'll, I'll repeat it now. It's uh, Mike Dicka said just a few weeks ago, um, with all of this is particularly as it relates to the NFL and all the the, um, uh, the the media we're seeing as it relates to racial inequality, uh, which is something that is very important in what we're living through right now. Mike Dicka says, there has been no oppression in the last 100 years that I know of. He's referring, of course, to the United States. There has been no oppression in the last 100 years that I know of. Now, a clearly debatable topic, perhaps to some, but nonetheless, probably not the brightest thing to say uh, in the midst of all that we're going through. And I would say is an example, or at least a questionable example, of how well EQ is demonstrated there. I'll give you a couple more examples. Uh, this is Reese Witherspoon. Uh, a couple weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal uh, did a really nice weekend uh, article, uh, one of the pullouts in the weekend journal. It was November 4th weekend. Um, Reese is focused on uh, female inequality and really focused on the female roles in Hollywood. And uh, this is more as a director and, and perhaps engaging in, pr in production of, video, of, of movies. And I, I found the article to be quite fascinating as I was, I was preparing for this discussion, you know, just two weeks ago. It was just nice to read something that uh, it's, it's so powerful to see what folks, uh, again, much like what John Lewis went through in the civil rights uh, period that we uh, went through many years ago. I think Reese is going through um, uh, much regarding gender inequality, or at least conversations that we need to be having across the globe as it relates to gender. And I appreciate that I believe she has high EQ focused on uh, making progress in something that is otherwise very difficult. And then I just can't not put this up, regardless of your political uh, perspective, uh, and, and I mean regardless of, there has to be some question of EQ. Now, what does this tell us, though? Well, um, this would probably fly a bit in the face of what I'm suggesting, which EQ, high, high EQ and, and IQ balanced has uh, a tendency to lead to success. Um, but, but it's obviously also saying that, boy, you can still be successful even if you have perhaps question mark around the level of EQ that you possess. With all due respect to our president, again, just lends to lends itself to discussion nonetheless. So let's get out of the celebrity and political landscape and talk a little bit more about at least what I've seen in my workplace um, and the places I've been and, and probably what you see as well. Um, these are, uh, you know, Dr. Gray here uh, is an example, but if, if you really think about physicians or caregivers, and again, and I'm in the line of uh, business and healthcare, bedside manner massively matters. And you hear that talked about quite a bit with docs in particular. So how's the bedside manner? Well, how do you qual quantify bedside manner? You can't, but you can look at their clinical outcomes. So you, you can quantify much of their IQ and how their performance is clinically. But I also believe that, you think of this as a consumer, when you go to the doctor or you're working with a caregiver that's helping you or your family member with care needs, um, EQ is important. Why? Because you need to be able to communicate with them about your care needs. You need to understand, uh, particularly if it's a stressful part of healthcare, um, what the outcomes are, what the situation looks like. If I'm, uh, on the other hand, if I'm knocked out and if I need brain surgery, yeah, I may care a little bit less about EQ and focus on who's the best brain surgeon so again, there's a balance here. For those of you that are involved in negotiation, boy, if you, if you read negotiation books, um, some of which I've read, a lot of this comes down, they won't call it EQ as much, but a lot of this comes down to understanding the person on the other side of the table, what what interests them, what uh, what emotions that they have around a particular deal, and what is important to them uh, in terms of getting to the finish line. Uh, some of you in the sales and marketing world, uh, I would say that you know, in some ways we're always selling, uh, you've heard that line before, uh, whether you're pitching an internal project, uh, et cetera, in, inside your company. Um, but nonetheless, sales and marketing folks need to really read their audience and adapt to the different needs and desires of the people they're trying to work with. And then teamwork is a no-brainer, right? You've got to have uh, those, those I think, that are best on teams are those that um, can work well with others, have good EQ. And even in analytics, again, this is my skill set, more on the finance side of the world and what I do today. Um, I spend time working on discounted cash flows and different uh, valuation tools, et cetera, both from my background and what I do now at US Renal Care. And I think analytics, uh, in order to really demonstrate it or portray those in something that can be meaningfully acted upon, you have to have, you should have uh, a good EQ focus in order to um, 
in order to convey the analytics to other folks. Let's talk about uh, in the in the at home with uh, family and friends. Um, I'm going to play a video here in just a moment, and I, I assume since everyone's on a webinar, this won't cause any problems with uh, um, uh, with sound. But I'm going to play just a short video that I think is uh, a hilarious and b gets to the heart of uh, emotional intelligence as it relates to listening and communicating and understanding others. Uh, I also say playing nice in the sandbox. If you have kids, you know, uh, uh, and, and even as adults, um, adults play nice in the sandbox when they have good EQ and they care about other people and understand what their needs are. But take a look at this video, and if if, if you um, if, if you uh, have to look at it, if you have to watch it later as well, it's called "It's Not About the Nail." And what you can do is go find this on YouTube, and it is uh, very interesting as it relates to EQ. It's just there's all this pressure, you know, and sometimes it feels like it's right up on me, and. I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head, and it's relentless. And I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would, trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. That, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just... Don't... Try to do things my way. So I have to keep on talking You got to give them credit. I mean, that's pretty good. Uh, where does it get better in the home than than um, having EQ by, you know, perhaps not listening? Now, some of you may bring this back to your spouse or your significant others or your friends tonight and uh, and help them understand a little bit more of where EQ can play a big role at home as well. So let's switch gears and talk a little bit about a little bit more about where you fall on the balance between IQ and EQ. And we're going to do a poll here in just a minute. I'm going to read out uh, the five key. Topics. I'd like for you to, if you can, grab a pen and paper and just jot down uh, simple yes/no answers to each of these questions, and we'll see how everyone does uh, with this EQ pop quiz. So, number one, yes or no? You sometimes feel like others don't get the point, and it makes you impatient and frustrated. Yes or no? So again, you sometimes feel like others don't get the point and it makes you impatient and frustrated. Does that ever happen, yes or no? You're surprised when others are sensitive to your comments or jokes and you think they're overreacting. So again, you're surprised when others are sensitive to your comments or jokes and you think, my gosh, they're overreacting. Does that ever happen, yes or no? You hold others to the same high expectations that you hold yourselves. Come on, some of you out there. You hold others to the same high expectations you hold yourself. Yes or no? You sometimes find others are, are to blame for most of the issues on your team. Again, let's be honest. Sam's not seeing who says yes or no to these questions. Let's be honest. You sometimes find others are to blame for most of the issues on your team. Finally, you find it really annoying or you find it annoying when others expect you to know how they feel. You find it really annoying when others expect you to know how they feel. So Sam, I'm going to let you open up to the poll. Let's just do a quick, how many yeses did you have? Zero, one, two, three, or five. How many yeses did you have? Sam, go ahead. 
Great. So the poll is launched, and so we'll leave it open here for folks to answer. Again, how many yes answers did you have? We've got zero, one, two, three, and then four or five. So it looks like we've got most of our votes in here. We'll give it a few more seconds. All right, and responses are in. So we'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results here. So Mike, we have 0% with um, zero yeses, 30% with one yes, 33% with two yeses, 25% with three yeses, and then 13% with four or five yeses. I'll go ahead and hand Thanks. it back over to you here. Great, thanks, Sam. All right, so I'm I'm very happy, uh, given this is the first time I've actually done this poll, that no one said they had zero. So thank you all for uh, being somewhat honest. Wow, there's um, uh, the way I think about this is if anyone, for those of you with a one, um, we need you to help run the next webinar on EQ. Um, your EQ is 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 very, uh, perhaps you could even argue is a bit low. If if maybe some of these you're not acknowledging, and I'm just teasing, of course. Um, I, I think many of these, you know, if you have two or three good balance, four or five, thank you for being honest. It's probably the reality of where most of us fall. And, you know, at the end of the day, it really comes down to, and there's many other questions like this um, that can help you identify what what's your EQ look like. And I'll, I'll give you a few examples because I think there actually are some good examples if you're interested in learning a little bit more out there. Talent Smart, as I mentioned, actually has a test. And uh, Talent Smart does something uh, called a 360. Um, I would highly encourage uh, something, this is something I learned at, at DaVita that I think does a tremendous job of 360 feedback. 360 feedback, 360 degree feedback is uh, focused on uh, getting feedback from all your team. Uh, people often go to their boss and want feedback, but what about the people that report to you or your peers? Are you getting feedback from them? The Talent Smart does a pretty nice job of that. There's a test out there, I'm actually not familiar with it, uh, specifically haven't, haven't looked into it, but uh, Mayor Slovi is the uh, the name of the folks that actually I think created the term EQ back in the uh, 1990s or so, and they have an emotional intelligence test. If you Google it, MSCEIT, there is an interesting uh, set of materials out there uh, that I think is it is at least interesting to understand. They have it broken into different area scores and branch scores, et cetera. And again, if you do some Googling on this, you'll you'll be shocked how involved Harvard Business Review, Harvard Harvard Business School has a uh, um, some information on this as well. There's quite a bit of stuff out there where you can even quiz yourself, you know, do you lead with emotional intelligence, for example? And again, I, I think it's fascinating to learn a little bit more about. By the way, the questions, uh, I'm going to go back for a moment. I, I should have stated the questions that I used were not my questions. Uh, they were actually from a Harvard Business Review uh, study or, or, or article that I found online by uh, someone named Muriel Wilkins. So again, not something that I, these are not my questions, but I thought interesting to use uh, on this discussion today. So as I start to kind of wrap, uh, what I want to do is talk a little bit about what you can do to balance your IQ and EQ. And again, um, you know, in my mind, EQ is so important to have regardless of what you do, what your career is. It doesn't have to be in sales and marketing. As I said, someone like me with a finance background, I think it's critical to have. But you won't be surprised uh, when I say that the in my mind, the most important thing to have, and this kind of goes back to the funny video we watched, is, is the ability to listen and hear and observe what's going on. What is your awareness? And I talk about this a lot. Um, I talk about it at home. I try to I talk with my kids. What is your awareness to kind of what's going on around you? Um, I certainly am not going to sit here and pretend like I have ex excellent EQ because I screw up all the time with my EQ and I recognize it, though. I have awareness when I do, and I think that's the most important thing I would encourage all of you to be to be mindful of. Of course, um, walk a mile in someone else's shoes. I think this is a, uh, the best way to describe EQ in many ways. Um, get a feel for what others might experience. And I am reading the John Lewis book uh, right now, uh, nearly finishing it up. Boy, I often think, what would it have been like to walk a mile in um, John Lewis's shoes or other folks that, that he worked with when he was 20, 21, 22 years old in Nashville uh, doing the Freedom Marches and uh, uh, being violently opposed, whereas 
they express no violence, how, what would it have been like to walk a mile in their shoes? And I also encourage you, as I mentioned earlier, there's a couple good books out there. This Emotional Intelligence 2.0, I actually received a book, um, again, at DeVita several years ago. They did a seminar on this, and this is an interesting book. Um, it's actually an easy read, the way they break it up. It's not a boring uh, conversation about EQ. It's not over, overly touchy-feely. It's more, hey, what is what what goes on with EQ, and why is it so important in the workplace and what you do in terms of leadership and managing your team? I also think that, uh, you know, Setting goals, I'm a big believer in setting action items and goals and what I do at work, but also how to hold myself accountable. Um, you know, one of the things I did is uh, I, I used a software program called OneNote, and I, I kind of just, uh, as I, I fly a lot for work, so one of the things I was doing is, is looking at what are my relationships like at home with my colleagues, um, with, with my uh, with my peers or friends, and, and what about with my enemies, too? And, and what can I do to be observant of those? Uh, just so important to, to, to take a moment and, and set out those action items and goals that I may then hold myself accountable and, and act on if necessary. And then finally, I mentioned the 360 feedback. Boy, I think this is important, and not enough people do it. Um, not enough people seek feedback. And I, I, have, I do want to, to note, you, you have to be careful about feedback because uh, it can't be forced. It has to be uh, kind of agreed upon. It has to be understood what the what you're trying to achieve, and it can't be rushed, and it can't be overwhelming for folks. If I go ask my boss for feedback every single day, uh, I'm not going to get a positive reaction because it becomes burdensome to some extent. On that topic, let's talk about your boss. Well, where does your boss fall in the balance between EQ and IQ? Uh, after you've asked yourself the question, after you work through, hey, where am I on that spectrum? Some extent, where's my boss then on the spectrum? And we've all had those bosses where perhaps EQ is out of bounds a bit. And so, how do you deal with that? By the way, in my mind, Steve Jobs also a great book that I read uh, not so long ago. Uh, Steve Jobs is a perfect example, in my mind anyway, of a highly successful entrepreneur with what many would argue is a very low EQ. And if you read his book, you read the book written about him, uh, it talks specifically about uh, his, his EQ and how low it was. He had people that could not, had a very difficult time working with him. So how, again, uh, can it happen that someone with such low EQ is successful? Well, uh, you know, I would argue he just so happened to have an off-the-charts IQ and he's, he happened to create a product that every single one of us wants or is using as we speak. Um, and so it's not to say that, you know, someone like Steve Jobs who perhaps had low EQ, although he did a great job in front of audiences, so there's a piece of his EQ that worked really well. Um, but nonetheless, someone that I think is a good example of, of low EQ. So how do you manage a boss with low EQ? How do folks with Steve Jobs manage it? Well, in some ways, they pro probably needed a polar opposite, someone with patience who could uh, understand and, and work with, with Steve Jobs, someone that can communicate. And communication, I think, is a really important one. Um, don't hide. You actually want to communicate with folks um, if you're struggling with their EQ. Um, try to be empathetic. Maybe there's something going on that you need to be more aware of. Um, but those with, with low EQ still want to talk about themselves. They're still human beings. So communicate. Don't ignore and walk away. Believe in follow-up. Follow-up on action items. Follow-up on, hey, um, I heard you say this. Is this, you know, is, is this how I should follow up on that? Is this what would be most effective to get something done? Um, certainly seek clarity. Um, you know, again, I, I would caution you don't want to annoy someone in terms of follow-up and clarity, but it's important to understand what their expectations are, and, and sometimes it's good to to uh, to seek that feedback and that clarity before making any assumptions. And finally, of course, if you can't, if the, if the pri prior suggestions don't work, just kill them with kindness. Kill them with kindness. So my suggestion to you with that short overview is what if EQ, what if emotional intelligence matters as much or even more than IQ in both business situations and in life? So it's very difficult to quantify what EQ is and how it's measured, et cetera. But what if you focused a little bit more on your EQ this Thanksgiving and this holiday season, and looked a little bit more at your work relationships, your colleagues, et cetera, and asked questions about your EQ, and looked at others' EQ, and assessed, boy, 
but the successful people, generally those with a balance between IQ and EQ, I bet is you're going to you're going to find that generally it's true. Generally, it's true that IQ plus EQ and a good balance there equals success. So with that, I will end this and open it up for any questions that folks have. And of course, go Buffs. Great. Thank you so much, Mike. And as a reminder, you can submit your questions for Mike through the chat interface. Um, so, Mike, I wanted to go back to the topic of negotiation that you discussed and bringing emotional intelligence into these conversations. What recommendations or tips do you have on bringing emotional intelligence into ne conversations around that involve negotiation? Yeah, same. Good question. So, um, you know, I, I think negotiations. There's actually, um, as many of you know, there's some tremendously good courses on negotiation. I think. Boy, when I got my my uh, my MBA back 10 years ago, there I, I'm not I'm not mistaken. There was uh, uh, good course topics on negotiation, certainly organizational behavior, which um, you know is a different topic than negotiation, but nonetheless um, centered around perhaps EQ. So negotiation. So um, in the world of what I do, uh, a lot of times whether we're acquiring uh, outpatient dialysis centers or negotiating with physicians on different partnerships, it is around. It truly is around negotiating a deal, just like anything else that you uh, would do in the business world. Or when I'm internally pitching, in fact, we're going through budget cycle right now, of course, so I'm pitching, perhaps I'm pitching my budget, negotiating uh, where I need to spend dollars and where I don't. But um, you know, each of these negotiations, particularly one where there's someone across the table that you don't know as well, um, emotional, good emotional intelligence um, would suggest that you get to know those person that those those people that you're negotiating with. You get to understand what motivates them. What are they really seeking? And again, even a good negotiating book will talk about this. Um, understanding what their um, alternatives are. Understanding where they're emotional on certain topics that are that are very important to them. And and focusing on that. And I want to I want to um, bifurcate this with being manipulative in negotiations. Yes, negotiations tend to get tense sometimes and yes, you need to ask for more knowing that you're going to get less, et cetera. So there is certainly an art to that negotiation, but I'm not suggesting that that um, trying to implore uh, EQ means that you're trying to be manipulative in a situation. You're simply just trying to understand um, what is important to the other side. Um, and I think that is so important in, in any type of negotiation. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Um, another question here for you. So this individual um, has never managed others, but they're hoping to manage in the near future with their current employer. And so that being said, what suggestions or recommendations do you have for someone with no prior experience in managing others um, as they're stepping into this role? How would you suggest approaching that with emotional intelligence? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. Look, managing people is very, very difficult. And, um, you know, again, I believe in EQ. I'm, I, I try to be aware of my EQ. But even even with that, I, I struggle sometimes to manage team. Why? Because I think with EQ, if, if you're going to start managing or hope to manage people, you, you need to, one of the most important things is you need to understand what motivates people that work for you or work on your team. What makes them tick? Why do they get up in the morning? And, you know, um, in the healthcare world, if, if we're focused on growth, if I were to go around and explain that it's all for financial benefit in healthcare, um, some people aren't going to bite down on that, and, and nor would I, frankly. Um, part of the reason I love healthcare is because I love taking care of or getting the opportunity to take care of patients, even in what I do as a business person, as a non-clinician. I go into our dialysis clinics, and I chat with patients. I did that at DaVita, and I do it now at U.S. Renal Care. Um, I, I think the importance is know what motivates other people on your team that you'll be reporting to or that will be reporting to you. I certainly think some of the, the recommendations I made in terms of books, um, they're, they're actually quite helpful um, because at the end of the day, um, those will tell you a little bit more about how to be con conscious of your, of your emotional intelligence. And frankly, most of those books are nothing other than just books around leadership, how to be good leaders, uh, how to be a good leader. So take a moment, do some research, uh, look at some of the literature on emotional intelligence, um, and again, as teams start reporting to you, try to understand and ask them what motivates them. 
That's great feedback. Thanks, Mike. Um, another question for you. So I, I want to ask this as a pointed question, but also general. So this is a two-part question. So specifically in sales and marketing with your organization, have you trained your sales team on emotional intelligence? And if not, why not? And if so, what did that training look like? Um, and, and I want to ask this in general, so not just for sales and marketing, but also all components of an organization. Yeah, it's an it's a excellent question. So, uh, um, boy, um, it is a pointed question because, uh, you know, I was just with my team last couple of days here at U.S. Renal Care, and just, just uh, for the record, I, I think I'm five weeks in. So the answer, the quick answer at U.S. Renal Care is absolutely not. I have not gone through this with the team. Um, my key focus right now is, as I mentioned, and really trying to um, understand what motivates them and understanding uh, what our goals should be and then helping, uh, you know, work through those goals with them, working with, with the team on that. Uh, but prior at um, um, at North Star Anesthesia, something a little bit different. I didn't bring this up on the topic. Perhaps I should have, but um, there is a website called Because I Said I Would. Because I Said I Would. And if you Google that, there's a gentleman, very interesting story. I won't go into it, but effectively – a young gentleman started an initiative called Because I Said I Would, and as it's as it's clearly articulated, um, I think he I think if I remember correctly, he he made a promise to his father or some other family member uh, one time, and then and then he felt the need or was extremely compelled to go uh, fully commit on on that promise. And to me, a lot of emotional intelligence is also kind of doing what you said you were going to do um, and understanding what that really means in life and in business. And so um, I did do some work with because I said I would with my team. Um, we didn't necessarily, I didn't necessarily call it EQ training. Um, what I'd like to do, frankly, is uh, in terms of your question, or what did it look like? There are seminars with, um, with the, and actually this is where I mentioned early on the, on the discussion, in my disclosure, I was not an HR individual, although I believe in close, close partnership with my HR team because um, they're actually, you know, most, a lot of HR people are really good at this stuff. And they can help lead a team around uh, EQ. They can help manage through that. So um, if I did, and, and when I do a training that's a little bit more EQ focused, kind of in a talent smart way, um, I will probably leverage our, my HR team to help lead that versus me leading it. But I will be obviously a, a key part of that. And, and part of that too is just a reminder that I'm a student, right? Uh, I'm not an expert at EQ. Um, so it's hard for me to teach it if I'm uh, still learning. I hope that's helpful, Sam. Yeah, that is. Thank you. Um, another question for you. So do you have a daily exercise or do you have anything that you regularly do to keep focused on emotional intelligence throughout the day? Uh, is there anything specific a, you're doing? Yeah, that is an awesome question. Uh, boy, um, I wish I could say I had a daily, um, and, and it's actually a great point. I'm going to take a note to myself. Um, so I, I am a big believer and exercise to number one. I'm I'm in my 40s now, so I'm becoming an old man, and I'm I'm adding LBs to my midsection. So um, you know, I, I really do uh, focus on on exercising so I can keep up with my kids on the slopes or hiking. But but I think that I actually care more about my my workouts and my exercises because of um, the endorphin release that we all you know. Again, as we're learning about the human brain, I, for me, it's pretty meaningful. And it allows me to have that greater awareness, a greater interaction with with folks on my team and other people I work I work with, or heck at home as well. Uh, so yes, I think um, exercise is a part of my routine, and uh, I think it's a critical one. Boy, the day to day other, you know, I actually think that this is a great um, suggestion for me. There is probably something that we can all do that helps remind us, whether it's you know you have something on your desk that you know that that um, you know. You don't you don't want your boss to come by and see this big EQ uh, sign over your door and gosh well, that person is weird right because it's not EQ is still one of those it's not necessarily as socially acceptable perhaps as IQ and so you have to be careful about that but maybe there's something on your desk or maybe there's something at home or wake up in the morning that just reminds you that hey you know picture of walking a mile in someone else's shoes or or trying to be mindful of what the other person may be experiencing or or trying to pause and listen a little bit longer. Um, those things that you hear every day, I think, are critical to, to EQ and find reminders. Uh, I will, to myself, find a better reminder to do that every day. Great. Thanks for those suggestions, Mike. Um, another 
one question, Bray. You've offered such great resources throughout this presentation, so thank you. I personally have so many follow-ups of notes written down of um, different resources I want to follow up on. But do you have any, are there any other influencers in the emotional intelligence space that you follow? For instance, like Tony Robbins? You know, um, I don't. Um, uh, but, well, actually, you know, TED Talk, um, there's a gentleman named, um, I'll have to get the name, and I can give it to you, and you can send out to us. There, there's, uh, TED Talk does, um, there's a gentleman that did a TED Talk um, on why, and I wish I could uh, go into more, I think he was either Australian or British guy, but he went into the uh, why, uh, why does one uh, do what they do? Why, what motivates people kind of thinking? Simon, Simon Sinek is his name. Simon Sinek um, did a TED Talk years ago now, and I, I've actually followed Simon a little bit because actually I think I even have a LinkedIn uh, post from him. Um, I, I think he is, I don't know that he's ever used the word EQ, maybe he has, maybe he hasn't, but um, again, it's a different, slightly different genre, but Simon does a really good presentation on the why um, of, of doing something. So the, I think he used the Wright brothers. Um, you know, if you know about the Wright brothers when they built the plane, they didn't do it for for uh, money, um, whereas there's nothing wrong with doing it for capitalistic reasons. Simon Sinek, or excuse me, uh, the Wright brothers actually did it because they were really motivated to change the world, and they were had this passion around uh, around aircraft flight, et cetera. It's just, uh, you know, David McCulloch wrote a fascinating book on, on the Wright brothers, but Simon Sinek talks about that, uses that as an example. I think he actually used Dr. Martin Luther King as an example, and I think he used uh, Apple as an example. Um, you know, Apple, Apple doesn't... Um, they, they, they influence the why you go buy an Apple product. It's not just a computer. There's, there's more to it. So Simon Sinek, write it down and uh, you go Google some of his work. I think it's, it's very interesting on this topic. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Um, and one last question for you before we wrap, wrap up here. Um, again, you've provided us such great information to take with us into our day-to-day, -day, both in our work and our lives. If you had one suggestion for what we could be more aware of or take with us into the holiday season and our work today to move towards that awareness of emotion, emotional intelligence, what would that be? Good question, Sam. Um, looking back at my slides quickly, um, you know, so let's see, 25% of you were sales and marketing, 25% operations administration. You know what? Um, I brought up the holidays a number of times, and you just brought it up. I think part of the reason why is because it is, it's a moment of or it's a time of reflection for all of us um, in terms of what we're thankful for, et cetera. And and um, and, and the holiday season, um, regardless of uh, of what you celebrate and, and respect for all, I think uh, it gives us an opportunity to maybe take a step back for a moment and just think about other folks on your team that you either report to, that report to you, or that you work closely with, and um, you know, this is, uh, take a moment to think about, have more awareness around maybe what you think motivates them and maybe talk to them about it. It doesn't have to, you don't have to go up and ask the point, pointed question, what motivates you, but try to maybe spend a little extra time understanding because what you'll find is that different things motivate different people. Uh, people that, that work for me, um, I know that it's okay no matter what motivates them, I just care about what that is. Some are more motivated by size of their bonus. Some are more motivated by if the feeling that they're making an impact. Some are more motivated by uh, about kindness and getting feedback. And, and all of those things are important because if, if you don't know that around people you work with, then it's going to be really hard for you to relate with them and, and get things done effectively sometimes in the business world. So take a step back, be more aware of the people you work with, um, and, and try to understand what motivates them. Wonderful. Thanks so much for that, Mike. Um, and thank you so much to everyone for joining us for today's presentation. And Mike, thank you again for all of this great information. Uh, just a reminder to everyone to view upcoming webinars and re request previous recordings. Please be sure to visit our website at www.colorado.edu forward slash alumni forward slash webinars. And have a great rest of your day and go Buffs!